All right, all right, all right. It's time to get on to day two of reviewing literary devices, numbers six through 11. Uh, just a quick recap, literary devices are techniques or ways that writers add meaning in order to make stories more compelling or interesting for readers. In plain speak, they just take boring stories and make them interesting. So how many literary devices are there? Again, uh, there are countless, but we are gonna be studying the top 11. Yesterday, we reviewed the top five, uh, which was simile, metaphor, imagery, symbolism, and illusion. Speaking of illusion, at the beginning of this video, I said, all right, all right, all right. That is an allusion to Dazed and Confused uh, and Matthew McConaughey. Uh, but again, as I said yesterday, if you don't know what that move, who that movie is or what that movie is and who Matthew McConaughey is, it is lost on you. So you have to make sure that your readers or the person that you are talking to understand what you're referencing. So today we're going to be moving on. We're going to go over personification, foreshadowing, hyperbole, diction, repetition, and onomatopoeia. Again, remember Ms. Garcia cannot spell onomatopoeia to save her life, so I will always use ono, okay? And I don't expect you to spell it perfectly either. So let's go ahead and get started. Personification, it's alive. Notice how it says person and personification. That's because it's giving something that is non-human life by giving it characteristics or traits of a human. So let's take a look. The stars dance across the sky. Stars are non-human. Dancing though is a human characteristic. We know that stars cannot dance. Therefore, this is personification because we're saying that stars can dance. My thoughts kept running back and forth inside my head. This is very common for Ms. Garcia as she is an overthinker. Thoughts, though, are non-human. Running is a human characteristic that Ms. Garcia does not do. Uh, therefore, thoughts cannot run. So this is personification because we are saying that they can run. The storm raged outside my window and I could hear the wind howling. A storm is non-human. Rage is a human characteristic or emotion. We've all felt that at one point or another. So therefore, storms cannot rage. So we're saying that's personification because it's saying storms can rage. But we also have another one in this sentence. Wind is also non-human. How is a human characteristic, so the wind cannot howl. Therefore, this is personification because we're saying that it can. We're making it alive. All right. The old car stuttered and coughed up a huge black cloud. Cars are non-human, even though we give them names. Stuttering and coughing are human characteristics, therefore cars cannot stutter or cough, so this is personification because we are saying that it is alive and it can. After running five miles, Juan's legs screamed in pain. So legs, even though they're attached to us, they're really non-human. They can't live without us. So they're non-human. Screaming is a human characteristic, so legs cannot scream, therefore this is personification because we're saying that legs can scream. So remember, personification, it's alive, which in itself is an allusion to the Frankenstein movies. Because if you ever watch any of the old Frankenstein movies, um, Dr. Frankenstein always says, it's alive when the monster gets up. But again, illusions only work if the people know what you're talking about. Okay, Ms. Garcia is old and knows a lot of things, so a lot of illusions work for her. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Foreshadowing. I saw that coming because it's a warning about a future event. It lets you know something is coming in the future. Now, this is not going to be the most obvious thing. It's just going to be like little hints dropped here and there to where you're like, I'm not 100% sure that's about to happen, but I could bet money that it is. And then it normally happens. Okay. Sometimes it'll be a hint at the very beginning of the text of the movie. And then it happens at the end. Other times it's going to be sprinkled throughout, but it's just that building sense of, I know what's about to happen. I saw it coming. You're not as surprised as the author would think you would be. Okay, so here are some examples. Um, you can go ahead and watch this on your own time. So Coco, where uh, there's a lot of hints that show that Ernesto had no real talent. Okay, so you might want to watch that. And then in The Incredibles, uh, they foreshadow at the very beginning how the villain is going to die. Um, it has to do with the capes, so you can watch that. But let's look at some textual examples. 
The evening was still. Suddenly a cool breeze started blowing and made a windy night. So that's foreshadowing a storm. How many times have you ever been outside and it gets super still, like eerie still? You're like, wait a minute, what's going on? And you look up and there's some thunder clouds in the in the foreground, you know, far away, and you're like, oh, I know what's about to happen. That is indicating a storm is coming, so that's foreshadowing. Now here's an excerpt from The Hunger Games. <clears throat> when I wake up, the other side of the bed is cold. My fingers stretch out, seeking Prim's warmth, but finding only the rough canvas over the, the mattress. She must have had bad dreams and climbed in with our mother. Of course she did. This is the day of the reaping. Okay, so right now we don't know what the reaping is, but it is foreshadowing that something called the reaping is about to happen, and it is so scary it causes nightmares, and it causes her to seek comfort from her mother. So even though we don't know what the reaping is, we know it's bad. Okay, here's a line spoken by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker in Star Wars Episode 2. Why do I get the feeling you will be the death of me? This foreshadows that Anakin, later known as Darth Vader, will kill Obi-Wan Kenobi. And there's tons of foreshadowing in Star Wars um, and a lot of the Pixar Disney movies and even Marvel, which are, are some examples here for number five. You can go ahead and take a look at these on your own. I'm a huge Marvel nerd, so just know that I will reference Marvel a lot. Um, but there's some foreshadowing between Tony Stark and Doctor Strange about the Endgame. And then Ultron foreshadows Scarlet Witch and Thanos' impact on the Avengers. So just throughout the movies before Endgame, it kind of lets you know what's about to happen, okay? So that's foreshadowing. I saw that coming. All right, hyperbole. So extra, because it's an exaggeration. Therefore, it cannot be taken literally or for its actual meaning. meaning. So let's look at some examples. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. The person may be hungry, but they could not eat a whole horse by themselves. Horses are huge. There's just no way. It doesn't matter how hungry you are. You won't be able to eat that in one sitting. Texas is hotter than the surface of the sun. We all know Texas is very hot, especially in the summer we feel like we are actually on the sun, but it's not nearly as hot as the sun, right? We all know this. Scientifically, it can't be done. It, Texas can't be hotter than the sun itself. So that's an exaggeration. I could die of embarrassment. Being embarrassing, embarrassed can be painful, but it will not cause you to die. How many times have we like just wanted to hide under a rock because it's so embarrassing? You're like, oh my gosh, I could die. But we lived on, and a lot of times we laugh about it later. It would make me it would take me 2000 years to finish Miss Garcia's homework. It may take you a long time, but nothing close to 2000 years, I promise. Again, because I do the same work you do, and so I don't want to be doing homework for 2000 years. I'll never assign that to you. For the most part. Okay. So, it took me an eternity to get home. It may have taken a long time for you to get home, but obviously not an eternity because you made it home. So, so extra is hyperbole. And think of hyper as extra, right? Like they're always jumping everywhere. That's kind of what you want to think of. All right. Diction. Words, words, words. So what is diction? It's a choice of words a writer or a speaker uses. So have you ever paid attention to where sometimes people choose specific words to say something and you're kind of like, well, why did they choose that word? Why didn't they use this word? That's diction, okay? So let's take a look at some text examples. So this is an excerpt from To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, Jem Fitch is a child. You can choose your friends, but you sure can't choose your family. And they're still kin to you no matter whether you acknowledge them or not. And it makes you look right silly when you don't. So some of you are like, wait a minute, Miss Garcia, this is not proper English. There's some things going on here. Well, the word choice is meant not only to represent that she's a child, but that she's using language from Alabama. She's from the South. So just by putting the terms this way, it's making it more real. This is what this child would sound like in real life. It's to make you connect with that child, okay? So again, the word choice was very purposeful um, to, to convey a meaning. All right. Excerpt from Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan too. Just remember Miss Garcia is a nerd. Faithless is he that says farewell when the road darkens. 
The word choice is not one we use every day, but it helps inspire a sense of mythology and wisdom. Because of the way that it's phrased, it's almost like you have to think about it. What does this mean? So that always kind of indicates like it's coming from somebody wise and you really have to think about it. And that's what J.R.R. Tolkien was trying to do. So here's an example from the Avengers. You can watch this on your own time. But pay close attention to the way that Tony Stark is choosing his words to reinforce his point that the Avengers did not do, do their job to protect people and express his anger at their failure. Okay, so just take a quick look at that clip. Here's another one. Excuse me, sir, could you please take your seat? I would greatly appreciate it. The word choices here are meant to be formal and show politeness. So let's talk about formal and informal. Formal word, uh, word choice is being very proper, courteous, polite, no contractions, versus informal. Think of your informal as slang, right? Um, there's a lot of phrases that I grew up with that I use that would be considered slang, and so I wouldn't use them if I'm trying to be formal. And we'll talk a little bit more about formal and informal speech later. Here are some scenes from my favorite series, uh, Sherlock. Now, he does have a British accent. It can be hard, and he talks super fast. But that is all meant to convey how smart he is. He wants to show that he's smarter than everybody. So he uses really big words. He talks really fast. He jumps from idea to idea. And it's all meant for the diction to convey that he is smarter than everybody else. He is ahead of the game. So you can go ahead and take a look on your own. So remember, diction is words, words, words. The words that you choose, that is your diction, okay? Repetition. We all know about repetition, so it's on repeat. So it's when words or phrases are repeated to show importance or draw attention. This especially happens in music lyrics. They repeat certain phrases or terms over and over again to convey their idea. But let's take a look at some text examples. The politician declared, we will fight come what may, we will fight on all fronts, we will fight for a thousand years. So it's highlighting that we will fight no matter what happens, no matter how long, we're fighting. So that's what he's really trying to emphasize, that we will fight no matter what. I felt happy because I saw others were happy and because I knew I should feel happy, but I wasn't really happy. Okay, so this is from Roberto Bolano. And so the word that keeps getting repeated is happy. And we're supposed to believe that happy, that's what you feel if you're using it that much. But this is being used in a different way. They're repeating it to show that he is not happy. So he's repeating it to show an emphasis on the happy part. So here's an ex expert, ah, excerpt from Winston Churchill's 1940 speech. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Okay, so we're really going to pay attention to the we shall. These are the actions he's trying to say we will do. We are going to take action, right? Sometimes, sometimes we're going to be defending, sometimes we're going to be fighting, but we will not surrender. And so he really wants to have that collective sense. We shall do something. We are going to do it. Okay, here's an excerpt, excerpt from J.F. Kennedy's, John F. Kennedy's uh, decision to go to the moon speech. We chose to go to the moon. We chose, I'm oh, sorry, see Ms. Garcia does make mistakes. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win and the, the others too. So there's a couple of words that he repeats over and over in this is the we choose. So he's emphasizing that we have made this decision. We are going to do this. It was our choice. Nobody forced us because he uses because a lot. So because is a reason, right? So he's trying to emphasize the reasons we're doing this. And then one, we're not going after a ton of goals. It's this one that we're talking about, okay? 
So just once, I would like to win something, just once. So this is Miss Garcia, definitely all day, every day. So just once, it's, it's indicating that it's never happened for them. Just one time they'd like it to happen. Not a thousand times, just one time, but it hasn't happened, okay? So remember that repetition is on repeat. They're repeating words or phrases over and over again to really stress their point. They want you to pay attention to it. And number 11, onomatopoeia, I hear that because they are words that are used to imitate or represent a sound, okay? So let's take a look. I heard the fly buzzing around my head. So buzzing is an onomatopoeia because it makes you think of that sound. The bzzz, that's what you're thinking. That's onomatopoeia. The class was so quiet. All you could hear was the tick-tock on the wall clock. So again, tick-tock is an onomatopoeia because you hear the tick Right, you hear the clicking sound of the clock. I enjoyed listening to the pitter patter of the rain on my window. So pitter patter is also an onomatopoeia because you can think of the like the the sounds. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's like the pitter on the window when it's raining. The ding dong of the bell doorbell woke me up, but the heavy bang on the door made me jump out of my bed. So think about when you ring a doorbell, ding dong. But then if there's a huge bang, like a loud sound, those are both onomatopoeias. And then you can take a look at some onomatopoeias uh, examples from TV and movies, just right here. And bam, just like that, we are done. Bam is an onomatopoeia. And we have covered all of the top 11 literary devices. Um, and did you like that? It was kind of clever. I know, I know, I know. So again, guys, if you ever have any questions throughout the year when we're talking about literary devices, use these pages as a reference guide, as a one-stop shop for you to be able to review your literary terms and really use them in the future. They're going to be very important when we annotate and when you write. So you're really going to want to understand at least these top 11. Again, we're going to learn more, but really focus in on these um, and use this as a reference guide throughout the year. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and head out. You guys have a wonderful day. You don't have any work today based on this, but later you will be using it. So kind of review it if you can. Talk to you later.